asked me if I would host the lecture tonight. It was an absolute treat because Richard Horton is someone whose work I've admired for 20 years now. Um, and, and, and mostly because Richard did not give me a job when I went and interviewed with him 20 years ago. Uh, and, and yet I've continued to admire his work uh, time and time again. Um, and, and I knew Richard first from the Queen's Stand at Epsom, uh, which many of you might know, um, which is actually probably the first image in this book, uh, which is a remarkable book on Richard's work uh, of the last 20 years, probably. Is that true, mm. Richard? Yeah, uh, yeah mm -hmm. an extraordinary collection of work entitled Microarchitecture. Um, I'm going to leave Richard to tell you exactly what that is. Many of you probably are already very well aware. Um, just by way of introduction to Richard, um, I knew Richard when you were at Golden Square. Um, oh, Richard is right. now at Barclay Square. Um, I think in the scale of squares, that's moving up, isn't it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, speaking as an American. Um, uh, Richard is a uh, professor at the Technical University in Munich, where his studio is focused on the work that he's doing with microarchitecture, as well as being director of Horton Cherry Lee Architects in Barclay Square. Um, if I might just make one small pitch before I pass it over to Richard to start. Uh, I think Richard is really an incredible book. I went down to the bookshop before, uh, hoping they would tell me there was a great stock on these books. Uh, there weren't any of them in stock. Richard said, however, very graciously, that if you are interested in the work, uh, the bookstore won't have it for several weeks, but if you are interested in the book, his practice at Barclay Square number 36 has them and would be happy to supply with you with one should you wish to go over. Um, I, I can't recommend it enough. It's an incredibly accessibly written book and also really from the student perspective, I think as much as from the mm -hmm. professional's perspective. So let me say absolutely no more and, and pass it over to Richard. Richard, welcome to the okay. Architectural Association. Thank you, Chris, very much. Thank you. Yes, the one in, in Berkeley Square is the Museum Modern Art edition from New York. So you get a white one if you come to Berkeley Square. And if you buy it here, you might get a Thames and Hudson version, which is that one there. So you can choose whichever. OK, it's uh, funny to be here again. I was a student here in 1960. And uh, uh, as Chris was saying to me, we, we, were building every, we were forced to think in concrete. And it's a fantastic relief to walk into the exhibition today and see some really nice things happening. In, in light materials and, and so on. But the school in Munich is very different to the AA. It's, uh, it's very technically orientated. Um, I, I'm part engineer and part architect, so you'll see, you'll see that coming out. But I love teaching. I love working with young people. And I hope that comes across, because I believe, there's a, as you know here, there's a fantastic innovative potential in the school that's carried through and into the profession rather than many universities try to emulate what's happening in the profession and this is this is this is wrong so i just start some obvious things that we we use in munich these words here you'll see cropping up and down here you'll see the website so if you're interested in micro compact home you can follow that website this is the institute website and generally, I give the student names for the projects. So it's a lot about student projects. And my job is to guide them. We have a team. I have a team. It's like an office in Munich. I have a team of about 10 all, all together, three student assistants, five architectural assistants, myself and a professor of extreme environments, and an, a secretary. So my own, it's like your own office. It's a fantastic privilege to work as a teacher in Germany. And then we have technical centers and so on that help with the, you know, the creation of use. And I've seen your, your technical workshops downstairs. It's, it's very similar. So the projects are, I'll just run, now try running through. OK. Now, this is my route every week. I, I live in Poole, on Poole Harbor here on the south coast. And I fly to Munich or to Zurich and hop between. So there's a sort of triangle. My, my life is a bit of a triangle between Munich, Zurich, London, and Poole. I spend Monday to Wednesday in, in Munich and then, then uh, come back Wednesday night and work in the office here for Thursday and Friday. And then during the, the holidays from the university, I'm 
I'm, in the, I'm on holiday in the London office. <laughs> it's a bit like that. Now, I'm, I'm showing this because I call it European design culture. I don't mean it's really European manufacturing culture. And, and uh, I show this because, for me, the joy of being somewhere like Munich or is that uh, it, it has this extraordinary network of, of factories and um, precision instrument construction. And uh, a quarter of the world's car production is happening in this area here. A quarter of the world's car production. Okay. And this is not all built here, but the organizations that operate here. So, and then, of course, we have, as a Euro Europeans, as opposed to other continents, we can see that we have Ferrari, we have uh, Lamborghini, we have Alfa Romeo, Fiat, and all the German car industry, Smart, VW, BMW, and microcompact homes made here near, in between, well, near the Rolls-Royce factories of BMW. And then moving across to Toulouse and the Airbus industries, and uh, the French car production industries, the British car production mainly north of London, but McLaren near London, and Lotus and so on. You may not be used to this, but for us it's very important because the products we're working with are connected, or the architecture is to do with habitation and transportation. It's, it's connected, product design, if you like, architecture and product design. So when I when I'm talking in America, for example, I like to show this image and say, the Europe, what is European? What is somehow, how, does, how do we condense? I like to condense European culture in this way, that we, we have a love of, of the small scale. We have a love of the, uh, the spoon design, the cup design, the tiny coffee, as opposed to the, you know, the big mug or the big uh, Starbucks. And we love the little chocolate like this. We, we enjoy the small scale in Europe and this is, this is very, very fundamental to our feeling and this is why I love to be buried in the middle of middle Europe and, and see, the, see the differences. And the other scale of things, we build the biggest aircraft and so but the attention to detail is the same in the, in the, uh, excuse me, in the, um, in, in the detail. We also take great care in design quality in, in car design at big scale and small scale. So if it's 350 horsepower, it's also we take care about 45 horsepower. We don't make a difference in design quality. So if you look at about classic cars, you see a Porsche, you see a Smart. So the, the, you, don't, you don't differentiate according to scale. And to me, that's vital. It's absolutely vitally European that we, we love the quality of the small scale. Now, the reason I teach in Munich, apart from the wonderful facility and the support system that goes with being there, is the environment. So the university where I teach is somewhere here, and it's about an hour's drive to the high Alps. These mountains here are about 3,000 meters. And this is BMW headquarters. This is the Olympic Stadium. And the new BMW building is, is actually here. So there's a, a rich mix. What you're looking at here is, is in a way, um, a myriad of tiny factories making very, very high quality components for, for BMW or for man trucks or for the aerospace industry or for the film industry, the German film industry, is also based here. But the proximity to the mountains is what appeals. Some buildings in Munich, if you don't know it, are these, for example. And this is the reason I teach there, that the city is here, uh, a short distance to the High Alps. And the other side of the High Alps is Italy and, and Venice and, and Verona and the lakes, northern lakes of Italy and the lakes of Germany around here, the pre-Alps, the forests. <coughs> the rivers, the creeks. And so what I'm talking about is not the materiality of architecture, but the, the nature, how we relate to nature and how most of the projects are a kind of marriage between, uh, finding a marriage between material and nature. And, I, and it's incredible privilege. The airport is over here, about 45 minutes 
drive to the city so the students can work in a city environment, an urban environment, but they can also work in a lakeside environment and so on and take their projects to, to, um, to high, high. For example, now this is, this is before I started in Munich. It's a small project done at the University of Pennsylvania at a graduate school with Ken Boyd and Brian Kelly, students. And we developed a, a tiny project that had to be the same weight as a horse or a cow because this helicopter is designed to lift, um, lift a horse or a cow from, the, from, from, from here. So the total weight here has to be empty weight of 300 kilos and a full weight of um, 700 kilos to, get, to enable you to get to about three or 4,000 meters. So the design is about mass and weight. And this is important because it's to do with the material you're using, the energy you're using. So you become aware of the materiality is precious. The material is precious. It's, it's you're, using, you're using energy the more material you use. So here's a little sketch. And we started and the students developed the design in Pennsylvania. And then they came to London and we built it and took it out to the Swiss Alpine Club and explored it on the Alps. This is on the south ridge of the, the Eiger on, uh, in the Swiss Alps. And the message, I'm sorry to say this, it sounds quite ordinary now, but touching the earth lightly, the keeping the body away from the nature, keeping the architecture free, has all sorts of aesthetic benefits. It, it implies that Nature is more important than the architecture. It implies that you can, you can move, move the architecture quickly. You can leave the nature behind. And notice as well, three-point support is, is important for fast adjustment leveling on a complex site. Now, this is at 3,000 meters. The wind speeds are 200 kilometers an hour. And this is weighing 300 kilos. And this is important. What happens, you know, when you're sleeping in this? And the, and the answer is you just dig a tiny, tiny hollow in the snow here, in the ice. This is ice, of course, at that altitude, under the snow's ice. We dig it in and backfill it, and we need to make a hole about that much. And we fix it, and then you have a permanent fixing. Because the ski house will, will dig itself slowly into the ice year by year. So you can leave it there a long time. I'm very fond of children and the way things like this can inspire young children at school or early stages. And so the image is not only about that, but the way that uh, this little book, which I plan, is a story about the ski house. That is, is, it, is it true? Is it possible that you could have a, a house that flies? And here it is. This is flying from middle Switzerland, central Switzerland, to across the mountains here to Zermatt in 45 minutes. And this is because of the aerodynamic design, the light weight, and the stability of the fins at the back that allow us to, to not get into a rotation which slows the helicopter down. All these things are things we study in delivery. So the, the more rotation you have, the more difficult the flight is, the slower the helicopter goes, the more money it costs. You're spending 35 Swiss francs a minute. You want to go fast. So this is an uh, exploration of nature and architecture of materiality, minimum use of material to achieve something exquisitely beautiful that when you wake up in the morning you have this stunning, stunning experience. This is landing <coughs> after the flight on the Swiss-Italian ridge. This is the Italian side. This is the Swiss side. So this foot's in Switzerland and this one's in Italy. This is Mont Blanc and the Matterhorn is to the right. So you can imagine waking up here with this view over the Turin, Turin Milan region. It's absolutely wonderful. And this is, uh, you can imagine, going from being taught at the AA about concrete and suddenly the liber learning that you can liberate yourself. If you feel under pressure from a professor or you feel under pressure from a teacher, remember that you can create your own architecture, your own. You are free to do that. And this is, this is wonderful. So here's the vehicle that lifts, lifts it. And it, as I said, it's designed to lift a horse or a cow off the mountain or a telegraph pole, which has so there's a weight limit up to a certain altitude. 
So here, here it is, looking out of the window in the morning. It's very primitive. It has to be because of the weight. Um, little windows here, uh, four sleeping positions. These, these harnesses hold four bunk beds. Not comfortable. It's not, uh, it's not sophisticated. It's beautifully unsophisticated. It has solar cells and a little wind generator. Uh, so when you go there, you should be able to press the light switch you know, when, when you go up the mountain. Now, <coughs> taking that on with student projects, here are the stu student list here of students working on the peak lab in, uh, again, near, near where the, the ski, ski house is now, working together with Swiss students from Lucerne, working with Munich students to de design, with the same rules, to design a bigger structure. This one is uh, each, each uh, component has to be 700 kilos. So this frame is installed by the helicopter first, and then each piece is lifted up. So this is a student project. It's not built, but it's the component is built. So this piece is constructed in aluminium as a prototype and waiting for sponsorship. Might be from a mobile phone company, might be from a Swiss uh, uh, Hilti fixings, which we do using the to, to fix, make the fixings in fit. So the students develop drawings like this to show the way the components arrive. So we fix this element first, and then each element, like a backpack, is fixed. The top unit is servicing. Uh, the whole, whole thing is covered in solar cells. This is the entry module. This is the uh, wardroom. This is the uh, sleeping module. And this is the laboratory for high altitude medicine a facility for high altitude medicine uh, studying the way people react to, to altitude set on the on the Kleinomatron. I hope this works. I hope it works. We might have to wait a moment. <laughs> ah, got it. Okay, there is the little house. There's Zermatt down in the valley. This is the bright horn, the Kleinomatron horn, and the cable car coming from the the ski house is on the mountain on the left. There's the Matterhorn and the Weisshorn. And so we flew from over here across to the ski house over here. So we're going to have a look at this design. And the, 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 the movie was made by students, of course. So you have to remember that this is an aerodynamic object. When you have winds of 200 kilometers an hour, you're designing a static aircraft, basically. It's static in relation to the, the Earth, but it's moving through the air at tremendous speeds. So the shape of the object is very important. So it's fluid dynamics, it's all of these things. It's aesthetics, it's, it's structure. So we're going in and having a look at the thing from the inside. And so there's a engagement between engineering and architecture, um, helicopter crews, understanding the delivery system, microarchitecture, is about the delivery system. The fire escape is down there. With the <laughs> <laughs> this is the sleeping level with four bunk, bunk levels. Very compact climbers, basically, and somewhere to put the patient to, to study or to work, little tiny lab, uh, the wardroom, the kitchen, if you like. And then on the upper level is the entrance, which we call the wet zone. The wet zone, when you're, when you're in this kind of environment, you're arriving with snow and the ice, so you need to deal with all of that in the first moment. So the first you see with all these projects the, you arrive in the wet zone. That's this, this part here. Okay, we're going on. I won't go. This is the delivery system. But okay, a little bit about the studio. I'm just going to come over here so I can see more clearly. The studio is. Um, we have about 50 students in the studio. We often have a breakfast at the beginning of semester to get to know everybody. There's often 14 nationalities. Um, in the institute, so it's 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 very it's a very international environment like here, and we design the components. Here's the 
very early prototype of the microcompact home built in the institute workshops down in the basement. And then the, uh, the uh, furniture system that we developed for the university so that we can move the tables very easily. Very important because if the students are organizing a presentation, we encourage them to be in control of that presentation, to move things, to direct things. You can immediately tell a good student because they'll, they'll command the presentation. They'll move the tables. Moving the tables <laughs> is the first act of architecture. If you're given a place to present, move it. Don't, uh, don't accept the fact that it's, if it's inconvenient, move it. This is the first test almost we look at and assess the students whether they're able uh, to do that. Quite often people are too shy to do that or they're it's very interesting how that works. Here are some little phrase bites we use. Less material, more nature. Short stay, smart living. Three point support, sitting only spaces. Architecture simulator. So microarchitecture is not a goal, it's a teaching device, if you like, to enable students to build fairly, um, fairly quickly in their career. This means they're on the phone for factories, they're on for sponsorship, they're learning the whole trade of architecture. Between zones, the uh, four zones, very important, uh, this, this point here, the four zones are sleep, hygiene, food, and work. You can almost make a, a living unit if you deal with those, that four, those four sequences. Think about it. You sleep, you wake up, you wash, you have something to eat, then you, then you work. It's a natural thing. So the zoning of the microarchitecture is organized in that way. Here's a, an example for a polar lab um, made of carbon fiber. These pieces would be carbon fiber. Again, the frame would be delivered first and then the, the unit would come in, and this has opening <coughs> sides with an insulating textile. So the carbon fiber prototype for that panel is, is built in the Institute. Small windows because the sun is horizontal in the Antarctic, so you don't want to have big windows because it would make you get too much light inside and you couldn't sleep because it's daylight all the time. So the student list is there. Now, Nature is, is the most important factor in, in all of this. These little creatures are incredibly sophisticated. I mean, you know, how could they copy a Swiss thermos glass? You know? I mean, it's fantastic that they are so beautifully designed. Three-point support, tail and two feet. So they're balancing in the wind. They've got a wonderful shape like this. And this is a chick penguin. So it's not a, a water creature. It's a land creature. So we copy the land penguin, the chick, because it tells us about how to survive, how to use minimum energy in the landscape. So don't think of this as unsophisticated. This is five million years of evolution in the Antarctic. And the British have been in the Antarctic for 110 years. And usually their, their things fall apart after 15 years. So just compare that. It's so amazing what nature does. Never, never underestimate it. Use it. And the textile, the soft cover, the soft cover, and, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful concept of communication, of balance. The mass is here. The energy is here. The weight is here. That's all the fish in there. So it keeps them warm. And it, the heat is, is gradually evolving in the creature. So we learn by that. How do we use that? How can we use that? Here's an example of how we would design a polar station using that device. You'd enter under here, and the wind is coming in this direction. So if the wind comes in this direction, the, you turn the entrance to shelter. And all the heavy stuff, the beer, the, the food, is all stored under here and loaded from below. And the framework is very simple, a simple shape with a little round um, a little bar on top with some windows so you can enjoy the view as we go there by ladder. And this, everything is prefabricated. But this is serious because it means that you build the framework as a kit of parts. You then clad it with the soft textile covering. It's a giant tent, if you like. But the advantage of that is you can then deliver these prefabricated living units underneath and lift them up with the crane here and put them in position. And then you have 
uh, you can operate 24 hours a day during construction. And this is very difficult. It's problematic for your protected from the weather during construction. The other thing is that a lot of Antarctic projects have a corridor lifestyle, and it's a very problematic thing. That The corridor is a pipe for people. It's nothing else. It's a, just the most dull, efficient, boring way to get from A to B. It's a pipe for people. So this kind of space, if you're enduring months in the dark in the Antarctic, having a volume with maybe a pool here, a swimming pool, for lectures, for the whole social hub, with the rooms looking onto the social hub. You could even go jogging up the spiral here for exercise if the weather outside is terrible. So there's a lot in this project that may not be obvious when you first see it, but learning from nature, three-point support, all, all these things, center of mass, heat, thermal efficiency, the rooms are the buffer, and so on. It's a charming project done by a Chinese student in, uh, in Munich. Here's the opposite, a tiny little migloo, Munich igloo, which you tow behind a skidoo. So the relationship between habitation and transportation that students study and utilize and try and make a fit between those two things. Here's another project for the mountains. This is done <coughs> by some students where the, again, we wanted to lift, look at study form, which is developed out of a spherical shape. So it's like a parachute, if you like. The form of a parachute is part of a sphere. And, and these, these pieces can be delivered independently. So you construct the frame, the central beam, and then attach the outer elements. Again, can be delivered by priest and bully. They can be delivered by um, a truck. They can be taken by cable car. They can be delivered by helicopter. So the students make their projects feasible from that, that standpoint. Here's Norman Foster coming to a presentation on Lake Silvaplana with, uh, and uh, very nice to see that that being used in the place where it was designed for, the event center. Another clim climatic situation. I designed a, I was giving a talk in Adelaide at a student conference and I flew a piece of microarchitecture here in, in, in the flight, checked it in and flew it because I wanted to show the students that you can do things with very little material. And I laid all the components out on the ground, took, unzipped the bags, flight bags with all their labels and put them on, put the components on the ground and I said, and I said I'm, I've got jet lag, I'm going away, you work it out and I just left it to them, and they had to work out what it was and how to put it together by just looking at the components. And the idea is that component design is, is crucial to contemporary architecture, that the pieces have to fit, but everything, every building is made of parts that have to fit. And they, they put it together beautifully, and then, then this, is, this is what it was. The tiny thing it weighs about only about uh, 50 kilos, I think, or less. And it's, it's a tiny thing. It's, many would say it's not architecture, but for me it is. It's, a, it's a, a kind of feeling of space when you're there. And you come up here and climb across, and it's, it can be put in the water, it can be put in the land. It's, it's, it's light, but it's, it's, it's three points support. It's not in obtrusive. So when it's on Bondi Beach, when they took it to Bondi, they could put it on the beach and these people weren't up in their arms saying, you're blocking my view of Bondi. They could see through and the, the uh, surf lifesaver could keep a look out for sharks and, and do his job in the, in the shade. So it's a delight. Again, the feet are, are just sunk into the sand and that holds the thing from wind. But if we have very strong wind, then we put a line from this point down. So another example, very delicate, very light, but showing how you can make some sort of beauty with very little material. Some students made another project in Malibu from Munich. They made a project in Malibu and got uh, sponsorship from Kimse, from Alu Maya, from Swiss, Alu Swiss, and this is photographs they took on Malibu. 
boat design. We do, we do boat design, and this is an example of a carbon and solar boat. So when the boat is parked in the marina, it's totally burning energy for the battery. And then when you, you arrive at the boat, you slide back the rear thing, climb inside and winch up the, the hand winch up the roof canopy. So you can, you can lie out here. It's a proa design. A proa means small hull and big hull. And this causes an asymmetry, which means that the hull shapes have to be fluid dynamic design to make an interesting, to make the boat travel in a straight line. The motors are all in here, and people sit in here. This is an outrigger, like a, like a Polynesian. So the students design the LED lighting, go down to the tiny pieces, even the anchor. And this is the, the swimming ladder. So you fold this out, it's flush with the hull, and it folds out to give you um, access onto the hull. You can see it a little bit there. It's not very easy to see, but it's there. So this is now in, in a large model form waiting for sponsorship. So here it is in the marina, just earning energy from the sun, ready to, to perform. Another project is the TU Fin. This is now being built full size. It's a carbon fiber, uh, light, flat-bottomed boat for, with a gym machine. So you take the gym machine out, out of the gym, put it in the fresh air, and go across Lake Starnberg. This is Lake uh, Starnberg or Amazé near Munich. And delightful to work with students where they not only design wonderful model making, work with the fluid dynamic engineers, they, they build it one-to-one -one and they display it in the Berlin Boat Show, the Dusseldorf Boat Show, and uh, in Munich, the sport event in Munich, uh, the exhibition. And I set them the challenge of driving their boat up the Grand Canal in Venice. Um, and uh, we've still got to do that, I'm afraid, but it should be soon. So they're now getting European sponsorship to start a business based on this micro-architecture. Micro Another one, <coughs> I sometimes run projects in parallel. And, and don't be fooled about those creatures. You know, this is a highly sophisticated piece of engineering. It can, it can, it can swim. And it's not looking backwards, remember. It's not. <laughs> Nature wouldn't design it to, to row backwards like we do. It goes forward. It's, it's fast. It can, it, can, it can dive underwater. It can fly. It can dive down when it's flying to catch food. It's, it's a highly, and it can come out of the water and immediately take off. Nothing, no human cre uh, vehicle can do that. Nothing can do that, made by a human being. So don't underestimate. But to copy the action of this is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult. And we've been studying this for a long time. And people have been studying it, and, and we still can't get to a forward action rowing boat. That's what the objective is that I've set my students. And it's a wonderful challenge because it must be possible. But, and it'll be a little jump. Somebody will make a little jump, and suddenly it'll be possible. There are versions like a penguin slippers, which you can see on the internet, uh, that have been patented. So we're exploring all sorts of ideas. And just to show you that that's not impossible, the previous boat would be a 10.8 meter long boat. And this boat is, is 13 meters, I think, or 12 meters. This is the gondola. And just remember, the gondola itself weighs 500 kilos. Okay, 500 kilos. And it's one man driving it with six tourists in it weighing another 500 kilos. So you've got one ton of material which you're driving along, one person is driving along at four knots, singing, okay? So it must be possible to lighten up and produce uh, a, an efficient, forward-looking boat. Fascinating um, topic, which is we haven't solved the problem, but we're curious. Just to talk about, talking about boats, um, um, Poppy's here, I think, I hope, now. Hello, darling. Hi. <laughs> Um, this is where we live in Poole, and uh, this is the harbour. 
here. And uh, so the connection with boating is not just kind of indulgence. It's something that we've, I've done all my life. I've been connected with it. This is a view through the house when it was finished. And that's the view. And I, I love nature. I love the inspiration of nature, whether it's from the aerodynamics of a uh, pine tree. Um, a pine tree, by the way, is the Ferrari of trees. It's the most elegant tree. It needs the least material cover to grow and the least mass of material. It has the lowest, shallowest root system, so it's like a ballet dancer in the wind. And we're talking about very, very strong winds coming off the Atlantic here onto this tree in, in front of my garden, in front of our garden. And then the, 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 the little pier here inspired the shape of the structure of the house. The reeds here I'll tell you about later. And the landform leaning into the, into the nature. The tree achieves this by only growing branches into the wind. So what happens is the wind blows very hard and the tree, the, the branches go down and they kind of turn the tree like that. Isn't that amazing? And of course this object has grown all its life in that place. So it knows the aerodynamic environment so well. But isn't it incredible that the DNA of a tree can have all that knowledge and we only touch the surface of knowledge on something just like a tree. I mean, and look at all the other possibilities of nature. This is a south view. Poppy's room is here. My room is here. And the living is upstairs, of course, and for the view. It's a design to expand to the, to the west. A very simple case study house, not a complex thing. So it's modular, like, a, like the pier I just showed you the diagonal bracing to stiffness. So this would go on when we can, we would expand the house this way. That's located here on Pool Harbor, just there. That's the pier. And my mother's house I did as a student at the AA, which I'm going to show you in a moment. But it's a wonderful place to have grown up. And all of these things you're seeing are part of the youth. And I think it's important to think about your youth and what you like as a student. Don't just feel you're putting your youth behind you. Think of what you love. Think about what you, and let it carry your life. It's very important not to shun your instincts as a young person. As a, it's very important to trust your instincts. So here's my mother's house. Here's my mum. She's 90, 93 on Wednesday, and she she is my first client, and made a wonderful, wonderful uh, project. And this is the old student, this is a student at the AA in 1960. So we built this in 1972. And it's now English Heritage listed. And it was attacked in my final diploma by Norman Foster, who was my crit. And he, he, gave, he laid into me really hard and said it's terrible, you know, um, all of this. And then I built it and I went, many years later, I went back to his office to get a job and I showed him the project and he said, this is fantastic. I love this house. This is, you've got a job. You know, he instantly gave me a job. I didn't remind him until a few years later. <laughs> but so don't be worried if you have a difficult crit. Trust your instinct to carry you. And this is what I used to sail on the harbor when I was younger. Can't do that now, but beautiful, beautiful boats and architecture. To me, this is architecture. It's light. Light is the first dimension of architecture. Every place has a quality of light, which you can only enhance. Um, take two kilograms of light from the sun to power the earth for a whole day. Two kilograms of mass of light. This is my sister's house. It was built in the New Forest. We built it ourselves, so we made it all out of the components from the tornado catamaran. This is a, the beam from the, from the boat. It's actually one of these. And so we made them all the components very light so we could build it gently as a family. It wasn't a heavy construction problem. It was fast. We built the frame in five hours, six minutes, and 11 seconds. The rest of the house took a long time, <laughs> unfortunately, because I hadn't got, got the recipe. And I was moonlighting from Foster. So it was, it was a tough, tough task to design everything as elegantly as we did the frame. 
just to go on on the subject of boats and yachts, the, um, this is a project by students just last semester for a, a yacht point. And this is a, a for the Olympics in, in Weymouth. And this shape is supported by three uh, pontoons. So you land here and you go up the ladder inside and you look out. So it's, we call it yacht point. It's a beautiful object developed from the rocks that lie around Portland and around. So it's coming from natural. So they brought the, pe the, the pebbles and put them on and emulated the pebbles. So then there's nature even in, in this object. Recently, students developed a design for Virgin Galactic for the space camp, which will be the, um, the uh, flight. So it's basically for six uh, astronauts, $200 to fly for six minutes in space. And there'll be six astronauts uh, arriving and six astronauts debriefing. So the rooms are arranged. Uh, this is the, the could be the arrival astronauts. This could be the ones who've just been finished their flight and are debriefing. The nice thing about this project, one of the nicest, is the students designed the rooms in detail and connected the visibility of the Virgin Galactic designed by Bert Rutan to the, so when you're flying in this, you're looking through at space through these round shapes. So the light is always moving and changing as you rotate. And so they made the interior feel as if the, you were experiencing the space. And as you go to your room, in the, on the left-hand side as you enter, is your spacesuit. So you, the first thing you see is your spacesuit. We have worked on space projects. This is one for NASA, which the team here, it's a seat restraint and a, a desk with an opening top like a, like a child's pencil case or a, a desk so that it stops glasses and pens and things like this from flying away in microgravity. And the Velcro strips here for your laptop to fix down so things don't dis disturb. So basically you, f you move into this seat in this direction and you, you, you position it here so it holds your middle body stable. And this was developed with engineers working with the students and engineers from NASA. And uh, Hans Huber, the, um, the, the uh, designer who was a student at, of architecture and developed the space chair part, which is patented and is now on the International Space Station. So this is a product that the students have been working on and then has, is now on the International Space Station. Graphic detailing uh, machined out of a solid block of aluminium because plastics are not encouraged because they off gas. So if you're in space for a long time, it doesn't matter for six minutes, but if you're in space for long duration, gas off gassing from plastics can cause a buildup of gas that can, can explode or could be toxic. So they're very cautious about that. So we had to use aluminium for this. Here's uh, the students, three students with one of the astronauts at NASA and the engineers came to Munich and we went there. We worked in the electronics classroom at Building 9 in Johnson Space Center. And um, if I can get this to work, I hope it, hope it works. We have to wait a moment. You'll see the students testing uh, how it works. So we were given a series of a week of parabolic flights in the KC-135 by NASA. They were so impressed with the work that they gave us this. And, uh, and so the students every day were, were up in the vomit comet for obvious reasons. <laughs> so at the bottom of the parabola is 2G, and at the top of the parabola is, is about 30 seconds of microgravity. So it's patient, and, and this shows the transition from 2G to, to 0G.
because there's nothing inside the aircraft. It's very light, and it's only running on two engines. Two engines. Virtually vertical, it shows you the power of an aircraft when, when you only need two engines to do that. When the aircraft ends, no seats, no luggage, no people. Very cool. We also tested the shower. This is Constance Adams from Lockheed Martin, and she wanted to test the shower, which is a vacuum. We also designed this. It's a mixture of vacuum and water pressure. Very difficult. One of the students on the team on Sunday. The bed, bed restrict. The problem with bed sleeping in space is not to have the head move, so you have to hold the head in position. Because if the head bumps against something, it can slow it and the head bumps and you move and you wake up. So you have to keep the head restricted. This is the director of the Man Space program who came with the students on the flight. So it was a very, very close relationship with the students. Now the European, European program, the European program for the, um, for a short duration flight as well as Galactic. Uh, uh, She loved it. She was so good at it. She, the others were all feeling terrible, and somehow she was, she was wonderful. This is from um, Ellington Field now. Incredible feeling to, to do that. Okay. So just to move on. Uh, mass and lightness. Just to remind you a couple of things. This is my father in 1917. This is me in 1944. This is my niece, Anna, in 1982, at the Yacht House site. And look at the difference in materiality and design. And this is designed by an aerodynamics engineer. Now this, you can lift up and fold. The, the mother has to, or the father has to hold the baby in one hand and fold the baby buggy with the other and then put it in the boot of the car or take it home. Can you imagine doing that here? Imagine the, the, the impact of weight and lightness. And I want to show you this incredible image because in architecture, we still, we still adore mass for some reason. It's a, it's a kind of weight. And if I would tell you that in the days here, you know, 5,000 years ago, that man could have flown with this simple device, bamboo and silk, could have flown from here if the thinking had been light. So the problem is to think light in order to make real progress, real progress. You can make superficial progress by making a funny building or something like that with material, with lots of material, pouring concrete or whatever it is you do. But to make real human progress, you have to think light. You have to think, how can I use less material? So this is really what the message of this is about. This brings me to the microhome very quickly. I'm sure you've seen it published, all of you, but it's a wonderful project coming from the Institute. And it's literally intended to take away the weight of the home, to take away the intellectual or the math, to take away, remove the, not to say it's a family home, it's not a family home, but it's to take away the pressure, the cleaning, the energy, the material, to remove that and study what happens. And this is the result. So it's about having a piece of land and not consuming all of that land to live. How can we do that? And how, how is it that we can do that today? We couldn't have built a microhome before about 1990, late 1990s, because the flat screen television didn't exist commercially. The, um, uh, the laptop wasn't available to all students at that time. So there's many things, many factors, and the library was of weight. When we were students, we had to have a library. There were no computers. So the library has disappeared. The library is now a thin film of... So many, many things. The, the insulation value 
that we need for this is, is 35 millimeters of vacuum insulation. That didn't exist even five years ago um, in developed in units. So th how has this come about? It's come from doing all my crazy flights. You know, I'm, I'm getting on a flight every, every Monday. And I started to think about how comfortable we are with small spaces, how intellectually um, wonderful they are. They, they make your imagination work in a way that large spaces don't. So in a large space, you, you somehow or other, you're, you're you're, you have a different, different you, you're forced, like a prisoner, you're forced to use your imagination to liberate yourself. This is a wonderful thing. A student wrote about a microhome takes away space from you, but what does it give back to you? And it's very interesting. I can't give you a, a specific, but I use one of these. And, and it comes from this strange piece that you have in aircraft on a long flight or on a short flight, where you have a wonderful view, you have this enormous view, but you have everything around you. You're in control of everything. You have everything you need, food, you have access. So here I can sit here and have breakfast looking out, and I have the, the coffee machine here. I have everything within reach to have breakfast without moving. And, and the sleeping is up here. So there's something, it takes away something, there's no question. But what, what is that that it gives you back? Don't forget the small. It's extremely beautiful. Here's one of the inspirations. It's basically from aviation. Here's a crew rest container. These go in the underbelly of an airbus. So the crew of five will sleep there on a long flight from, for example, Munich to, to Chicago or Munich to Los Angeles. And they'll change crews you know, as they approach the end of the flight. And, uh, and so this is how they do it, and it's connected to the, the galley. So a lot of people are living in micro-environments, you know, on, 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 in, many, in many environments. We're used to driving, we're used to flying now, we're used to spending a lot of our lives in compressed environments, and they, we've learned how to make them beautiful. And this knowledge is so interesting. All the parties in the Institute end up with people crammed into the micro with drinks because you know what every party ends up in the kitchen. <laughs> it's a sort of law of, uh, of compression. But people like to be. The best dinner parties are not on the biggest table. Okay, if you're going out for dinner, you don't want to have the biggest table in the restaurant. You actually want, if you're real, you want to have the right proximity to the person you're with. So this is very, very important. This is a sitting-only space. The bed is above, but the standing space you need for dressing, for showering, so that we deal with function in terms of uh, height. So we get very, very personal space here. Related, obviously, to the Japanese tea house, so we don't need furniture, we don't need chairs, which are untidy things. They constantly migrate around in funny angles and all of that. Here, you, your seating is integrated, and the chair can be, the table can be slid away to make a guest bed underneath here. Raised above the ground, three-point support, like the tea house, don't look out, all of the others, the penguin, and raised above the ground to give, give the feeling of leaving nature as it is. And what we do is we construct the frame on the site and then lift the Level, level the frame and then lift the microhome and it sits on these six little supports. It doesn't, it's not fixed, it's just the way it has 2.2 tons. If we have a helicopter lifted one, we would have to build it to about 1.8 tons. But that wouldn't be to high altitude, that would be a relatively low altitude lift. This is a student village in Munich. Every microhome is LED lighting, so each house uses only 80 watts of energy for lighting, plus the lighting illumination below. So when we have snow, the lights shine on the snow. And we have students from every faculty, not architecture, but from every other. Sometimes an architect finds, finds their there. If a person here wants to rent a house, we have an architect in this one for a few months while this student is in Berlin. 
when that one of the students comes, uh, one of the English students comes and stays here for three months in the holiday. This is my house being delivered, but mine, mine is, mine is, I'm very naughty, I have this one here. <laughs> and, and this is it being delivered in five minutes, and the frame is under here, and it's just being put into position with a 40 meter crane lifted over the trees. So it's very light, it's very light. And then I can park my smart underneath the house. And this is summer in the micro. And we have barbecues, um, sodas outside in the, in the summer. And, um, and this is one of the students. He's rigged up. Uh, the windows are open, and, and it's a very nice feeling. Inside, this is my interior, which is full of aviation cups and saucers and cutlery and stuff like that, and little model helicopters and stuff like that. But the wonderful thing is you can, the personalizing of a microhome is with a magazine open or for the, the page you like. It's, it's not about nailing pictures to the wall and doing the normal things. You can just literally switch on the, a, an image on the, on the flat screen or you can have a laptop or you can have an image from a magazine. Uh, so this is literally how I live when I'm in Munich and it's a delight. I have to say it's no weight. Cleaning is, I don't, I'm not very good at cleaning, copying, copying. <laughs> so, but here's the coffee machine, um, but it doesn't need much cleaning. In fact, the little round vacuum I have, you can put the vacuum on the table here and clean the whole house without moving the vacuum. <laughs> so here's the LED lighting in the kitchen before it's fitted out. Here's the shower, Swiss fitting, mirror. Each zone has its own storage. Um, and lighting. Notice the horizontal lines. Very important because human beings have eyes arranged like this for, for defense so we can see cars coming towards us. We're going to have them arranged this way. So horizontals are intrinsically helpful if you have small spaces. Work on the horizontals. And the lighting needs to be horizontal. So the light, natural light, is all arranged to wash the surface that you're dealing with. Light is the first dimension. Here's a student inside preparing a meal and having a, you can have a, a, lap, a flat screen in the living space this is with the bed tilted up and have a second one in the sleeping, in the bed space. The important thing I set for the students, the most important thing is you mustn't see the bed from when you're working and you mustn't see your work or your old dinner from the bed. And this is how it works so beautifully because you literally, the psychology of trying to work when you see your bed, you know what I mean. It's, it's, a, it's a major problem. So we solve that by stacking it like this. <laughs> Important. We put one in Berkeley Square. We're working on a project now just, just near Berkeley Square for a business village of microhomes. So you, they're serviced, the, the fridges are topped up with with, uh, I don't know if this is going to be built. I mustn't say it's going to be built. The interior, I call, it, it's an instrument for living. It's like, if you like precision, you'll love the microphone. If you don't like precision, you won't. But if you love to see things organized and deal with things very lightly, and you'll love the interior of the microphone. It's very convenient. It's very, so we call it an instrument for living like this, really. It's meant to fit the products of the day. Sponsors from O2, we sponsored the first village, seven units, in 2005. So the students, myself and three of the other students, have been living there since 2005. And uh, many of them, the other ones, have been there for a year or more. The potential is for a snowboard village uh, where frames are installed on the mountain, and we have on the units, we have a drawer here where you can put your snowboard and your skis or your skis inside the drawer, and it's part of the insulation zone. So in the morning, the skis and snowboards and boots are all dry, and that's a lockable uh, thing. So if we're moving um, <coughs> a two-ton microhome, we'd need to use something like this one. This wouldn't be strong enough to lift a microhome unless we design one specially.
sailboard event, Silver Prana, Sam Banks and Poole were currently designing a little version to go to go here on, on Sam Banks for the sail people who rent sailboards. Tree village, like the business village, uh, a vertical stack. So these are reeds that, that go up Venice, Golden Key. I'll talk a little bit about Marika for a moment, if I may, five minutes. Um, Marika is a friend in Holland, an artist, and we worked together to make a design called a reed house. And reeds are important, um, very important, and very sophisticated. They basically um, take energy from the ground and, and uh, food and filter it and take it up into the sky. So these reeds are not just sitting above the ground. They're going right deep down into the ground to gather cooling and, and uh, ground thermal energy, just like a reed. Now, this can imp impact on projects in London. Here's a project where we designed and got planning permission for in Docklands. And so many Docklands buildings are designed to come down and they, they hit a kind of transfer structure and then try to look as if there's a podium and sit. And this is so dishonest because Do Docklands is a marsh. It's basically a wetland like Venice. And Venice has a vertical reeded architecture. The columns must be very close together. So we use the reeds very close to make a stiffen the structure to give us transfer structures where we have to make a long span. We lean the reeds over. We use the reeds to filter sunlight. So there is a greater reed density on the, on the west side because it's set, setting sun. On this side, there are big buildings, so we don't need so many reeds on that side. On the north side, we have very few reeds because we, can, we don't need shelter from the sun. The south side has about 50% reeds. So each facade is reeded according to the amount of energy it needs to avoid. We gather energy from the ground here and goes into the plant room. So it's acting structurally, it's acting energy-wise, and it's expressing the truth of building in that place. For me, that's an honesty which makes beauty in some way, I believe. But I mean, look at this thing here, you know, absolutely crazy. So here's many different projects, but I just want to explain that on a bigger scale. Here's a student project very large number of students for civil engineering, aerodynamics, and architecture, all one big group to make a, a European Expo Tower. This one's 500 meters. This is one kilometer. We call it K1. And this is a Basel. It's a dry lender Eck, means three country corner. And this is the Rhine, River Rhine, and this is France, Germany, and Switzerland. And so you take a cable car from each country into the expo building. And these are the pavilions for, and the reeds go down into the, into the ground just in the same way as the little micro architecture project does it. So you can learn so much from doing micro architecture. Don't think it stops with the scale. It goes right through your understanding in some way, beautiful way. Here's designing carbon neutral. How would you do a micro home totally carbon neutral? Looks a bit clumsy, I know. And we wouldn't like that. You, it's not saying you have to use all of these. This is a pellet stove. This is a seven. Is a, that wouldn't cause too much vibration now. But the reed, don't forget, the reed is going down into the ground. So the mast is an air mast for gathering solar energy or wind energy. And it's a ground mast to gather the ground energy. And so one day you'll come along, a machine will come along and drill the pole, put the ground mast in, put the sky mast in, attach all the energy systems, and the microhome comes in and is connected in to the system, completely energy neutral. That would be my dream to do that. We haven't done it, sadly, yet. Uh, it goes on to family compact homes. But even more interesting, here's a family compact home taking a different route where we integrate sitting spaces and standing spaces and movement spaces. So we make no difference. We don't isolate the staircase. We don't. We say the staircase is part of the room. So a study might be part way up a staircase. And this is explored here. I can't go into detail on this, but it's incredibly exciting. This would be divided into four pieces. That's a microhome dimension there. So 
you have one of these in the smart car that's in this one and this part that's delivered as a series of pieces which get stacked on top of one another but has an incredibly organic fit like being inside a car, well-designed car interior when you go into your study or into your bedroom or whatever with the sound system. Just to say one last thing about uh, sitting spaces. Here is a thing called a batch. And a batch is a New Zealand word for a beach house for comes from bachelor. But, and so some students did a design and we went to New Zealand to work there. And this is the design. That basically you build the frame, whether it's on a waterfront or a mountainside or hillside like here. And then you order the pieces. This is a living living unit. This is a shower unit. This is a dining unit. So you, you order a sitting unit or a standing unit or a sleeping unit. And you're living outside. So you have a barbecue unit and there's a boat storage unit. So the potential to really minimize these pieces is so exciting because the spaces that you have here are wonderful. So you're living inside and outside. Oh, excuse me. The recently the micro home was at the Museum of Modern Art. Here's Barry Bergdahl at the launch of the um, event. Uh, and a very exciting time we all had the CBS building, the UBS building. This is by James Timberlake. This is the, the micro home. And a lot of wonderful visitors. And afterwards the Microhome was sold to an American lady, has an estate north of New York, about 70 miles, and now this is where the microhome is, is located. Lastly, a reminder about the book, um, but I think it's 20 pounds, just to say that. And there are other publications, but basically the book is, brings you more up to date on the microarchitecture project, and we're, we welcome you to Munich if you're if you'd like to come sometime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>
um, I love traveling. I mean, I do love it. So I would love to have a microhome in the mountains and a microhome by the sea. So, and one in the city, of course, that would be perfect. To me, that would be if I was living on my own. It's not a place where you, you can have, we call it a 1.5 person house because you have a friend occasionally, but, but a guest, but you know, <laughs> it's not somewhere where you really want to live with two people. It's not practical. But some do. Some of the students, there are two living in the one behind me, number six, zero, zero, six. So um, uh, some of them do, and they've been there for two years, so they didn't like it. They even had a dog, you know, so there was <laughs> this amazing sight of, of, you know, the lady and the guy coming out and the dog. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful sight. Socially, socially they, you can't have a party inside a microhome, although they've got, tell me they've got 22 students inside a microhome, but I haven't seen it myself. <laughs> Must have been an interesting party, that. But, but basically, it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's not a social space. It's, it's quite a monastic space. It, somebody, a Swiss television reporter, said, went inside and interviewed me inside, and he came outside and he said, this is like a monk's cell of the 21st century connected to the whole world. And, and it feels like that. But, you know, great things are conceived and great things are made. With, I mean, Einstein sat in a bay window. He had a little bay window in Basel in Switzerland where he sat looking at the sky and thinking about his ideas about philosophy. And he needed that kind of enclosure in order to make the mind explode, to get free. And I, I believe in that a little bit. I believe that. This is on, in fact. Um, uh, one of the questions, or one of the things, Richard, that, you, that really intrigued me towards the end of your lecture, at, which seems to be e echoing through some of the questions, is this issue of scale, unquestionably. Uh, I got extraordinarily excited, probably being American, about the transferability of scale or the transferability of the ideas, uh, the engineering and everything else, the, the nature engineering, uh, to effectively a towering canary wharf. And I just wondered if you could speak a little bit more maybe about that, Richard. Taking, you know, the, the micro home, uh, the compact house and, and the iPod, I thought, uh, you know, the relationship was immediate and apparent. I, I got extraordinarily excited though when we took nature and the, the transferability of scale to something much greater. And I wonder if you could just speak about that because it seems to echo this issue about scale that's coming through and the smaller one having probably dominated more your, your talk. Mm. Well, you'll see the title of, of this talk, which wasn't the same as this talk, but was in MoMA in New York. And it was called Five per Perspectives on Prefabrication. So each architect who was exhibiting had to talk about prefabrication. And all of the really big buildings we build today are prefabricated. All the components are prefabricated. So the, the one kilometer tower I showed you in Basel, all the pieces would be delivered, you know, as components from different parts of Europe or the world. So the, the scale issue, but I think there's another issue here, which is we do, we have been building office buildings far too big. You know, now we have the lap Siemens office. You go to a Siemens office, built in the 70s in Munich. Of course, the computers were this size, so they would argue they needed a desk at least this size. So they'd be five meters square. Now, it's a nonsense to think in terms like that. So the scale, the chance to make beautiful working space that's, that's a different scale is, is, I think it's an exciting thing, but I don't know if that... But it works with what we were seeing, that you 
question of integral parts of the world. And I guess I want to expand upon that thing. You know, you brought it out with the read and mm -hmm. the way that the read works. But it's also the need of sort of calculating wind speeds against things. Also the way that materials act. I think it was looking at the complete work, right down to an extraordinary minute scale, but also seeing that increase, but watching the way, in fact, that, that uh, I think the problem is, is the complexities of completeness of the project. I think what can give mm. great meaning to something sort of passive and just kind of like that. But the, the uh, thing, if you look, look at great architects in the past, Corbusier and Foster and any, any they, and, and Saarinen, and they've all built tiny spaces. They've all wanted to achieve that. They haven't only been skilled at large buildings. They built door handles, Zaha did, you know, they built everything, furniture too. And I think that's the message. The underlying message is to be an architect is the light switch as much as it is the global vision. It's, it's all of these things, how to get, and the enjoyment of architecture is to touch, you know, there's not many buildings which you touch. Microarchitecture, like a car interior, you touch the surfaces. So you, you must use different materials. It's not plasterboard painted white, you know. It's not like that. So it's completely different. It's more like car or aircraft interior. So we, we feel there's, a, there's something coming, this relationship between habitation and transportation. Transportation has taught us a lot about scale, how to enjoy the small scale caused in the car design. I'm not really answering your question very well, I'm sorry, but, um, but I'd like to try to think about what you've said and try and answer it in another way later, probably better. So oh, that's nice. Yeah. Lovely you. question. Uh, listen, I'm not if anyone has a question, otherwise I'll get into a great conversation with Richard, which we could Dinner, have later. Yeah. One more here, yeah. The main goal is to understand whether the, the change in energy that we have to deal with now is, is a positive thing. In other words, it's, m it's my belief that the credit crunch and the energy crisis are connected. And, and that we've been indulging in too much space, too much material, too much volume, and now is the chance to explore a new, better way and a more intimate way with nature. And that's not a very good answer, but it's, it's essentially the, the truth that we have to change dimension. It's like, you know, Mercedes producing a smart car. It's, it's, it's that, and the smart car has a high quality, it's a high quality, it's already a classic car. The microhome is already a kind of museum of modern art product. It's, it's not necessary that your architecture is big to be successful, I believe. And I think this is the fundamental message. Think about really think about the material you're using as a, an, as a very precious object, not to be thrown all over the place like you know, in the past we have done. And I think that it gives a wonderful discipline to work and a newness, a freshness, a new vision about life, which I find so exciting. Well, they're very expensive. The microhome is 34,000 euros as a product out of the factory. So it's, yeah. <laughs> tell me, tell me, you tell me how many square meters in your car and I'll tell you how many square meters in your You think it's the same size? Okay. You know my answer on that. But the, the, it's not about, you know, a woman is not more beautiful because she's two meters tall, you know. It's not about that. Beauty and function are not about scale. They're about fit. They're absolutely about fit. And this is, this is uh, you know, 
to me as being a wonderful chance, a wonderful exploration. Sorry? Be very suitable for luncheon. <laughs> I'm not con- she's not convinced. <laughs> okay, and no, honestly, you're you're not the only one who's not convinced. There's a lot of lot of people. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a an exploration. This it's an exploration. Yes, very good question. What happens? What what happens? With a microhome, when you live in a microhome, you use less water because you have a small a shower. You, you use the right amount of water for things. You use the right amount of food. You don't go out and buy a ton of food because you haven't got the space to store it. You buy a little bit of food and you, you use it. You do very little cooking, which is, again, much healthier. You use raw vegetables. Uh, eat raw vegetables. Don't cook. High energy is not good. It's, it's essentially the same use to putting energy into food and getting rid of the nutrition. But all these things, using smaller plates, using smaller cups, using smaller glasses, all of these things have a very, very nice effect on the body and the human experience of life. Things become much more special. They become much more... It's like a, when you have a plate of a beautifully presented meal. It doesn't have to be a great pile. You know, we know that. It's, it's about the quality of the food, the quality of things. And I think, ideally, all of these things would come that we could produce a food. We could even produce, if we could, you know, involve the, 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 the food department, or <laughs> whatever it is, to find ways to make um, wonderful food in a more in a less energy intensive way. It would be very nice. How many cooks on television talk about don't fire up the oven? The first thing they do is have you know, tons of energy coming out of the kitchen. And you, you know, they're going, and there's all this stuff coming out. And I, okay, it's a fantastic taste, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm the last person to criticize that. But there is another route, you know, there's another way to live in a beautiful way. And I think we're, we're touching this, all this crisis. Is is so interesting because it gives us a new vision of ourselves and in that way. Richard, it's, it's, it's definitely time to take the time big meal yeah. now. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Richard, thank you very, very much. Uh, thank uh, you. Uh, great pleasure. Sure.